If you're familiar with this futuristic black Trans Am from an 80s TV show where it has lights on the front that scan back and forth, you might have seen countless projects on the web that have a 4017 light chaser circuit driving six LEDs back and forth to simulate this. There's a couple of things I never really liked about those common circuits, so I thought I would do my take on that project in today's video, which is sponsored by PCBWay. 10 PCBs for $5 plus shipping. If you have a PCB project in mind, go take a look, see if they have any sales or coupons that may help you get your project up and running. Check them out at PCBWay.com. The circuit I usually see is based on a 4017 chip. If you put an LED on each output, one LED at a time will go high, and after the last LED is on, it starts over at the beginning, but it only goes in one direction and starts over. But if you connect up the 4017 outputs a different way, you can make it scan along one direction and appear to scan back the other direction if you limit yourself to only six LEDs. So the very first output can just be connected directly to an LED. And for the next four outputs, what we're going to do is put a diode in line with the output that's driving the LED. So if we take the next available output, put it through a diode, then we can just connect it right up to that LED that we want to turn on. So now when this output Q4 or this output Q6 are high, it will turn this LED on. And because we have reverse blocking diodes here, we're not going to be trying to drive one output into another output. So whichever output is high is going to turn on this LED. And if we do that for those remaining three outputs, when the final output has gone high and turned on this LED here, and the sequence is ready to start over at Q0, this LED comes on, and we start going forward along here again. So it looks like we're going back and forth instead of just one direction and repeating. So it looks like this. But the problem with this is the car actually had eight lights on it, not six. In my schematic, I have it set up with eight LEDs that I control with a couple of 4017s. And the other thing I wanted to improve upon, the lights on the original car wouldn't turn off immediately. They would die out while the next ones are coming on. So it would sort of leave a trail going back and forth. So I'm using a little driver circuit with a transistor so that I can turn on the LED relatively quickly when it's time. But when it turns off and the next one comes on, the previous will still be fading out. For the first part of this circuit with the LED chaser, this cascaded 4017 network here, where I extend it so that I can get more than those six LEDs on, comes from this application circuit in the TI4017 datasheet. In order to keep this video relatively short, all that I will say about this for now, we're sacrificing a couple of outputs so on the first 4017, we actually only get nine outputs. And when these nine have all gone high one at a time, the first available output on the next 4017 continues the pattern up to eight outputs. And what we're doing is always sending our clock into the first 4017. We're sending a gated version of the clock into the next 4017. And we're also making use of the clock enable pin on each chip. So with all of this connected up, we're controlling whether each chip is accepting clock signals and advancing their count, or if the chip is even being held in reset or not. So I can use this to make an LED scanner that can do enough LEDs that I can go back and forth in a scanning motion with a total of eight LEDs. That's what I have connected up here. I'm using a typical 555A stable oscillator, and that clock comes into my first 4017. And for this AND gate, I'm just using a couple of NPN transistors, and the output here has a pull-down resistor. So the only way this is going to go high is if both inputs go high, turning on both transistors, connecting this to 5 volts. 
Each one of these has a diode in series, so I can connect multiple outputs to each other after the diode without causing any damage to the 4017s. So I go LED 1 down through 8, and then backwards 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. And then the whole cycle will repeat, so LED 1 automatically comes on, and my LEDs are scanning back and forth. Just like the original circuit with one 4017 and only six LEDs, on the very first or the very last, I don't really need a diode here because I'm not using multiple outputs to drive those LEDs. But in my circuit, I do use those because they're driving this little passive network driver. So we're going to have an RC charging and discharging time constant here and that's going to depend on the voltage we are controlling this from. So in order for them to all behave the same, I wanted to make sure I have a diode drop on each input here, so the timings will all be as close as possible. And now, looking at this transistor driver circuit, with a passive network like this, I have a bunch of 47 microcapacitors, and I decided I'm going to current limit with a 330 ohm resistor, and that gives me about 9 milliamps per LED. So next, I have to make sure I provide enough base current to turn this transistor on as a switch to reliably control a 9 milliamp load. Looking at the 3904 datasheet, if my collector current driving my LED is around 10 milliamps, the 3904 beta HFE gain is going to be at least 100. 9 milliamps divided by 100 is 90 microamps on the base at least in order to adequately turn this LED on. I wanted it to be on relatively quickly, so when I give a logic high here, which through a diode is going to probably be 4.4, 4.5 volts, that will start charging this capacitor through this series resistor. And to simplify this, I'm just going to ignore this other resistor and the fact that there's a transistor here, there may be leakage currents or other things happening. Technically, the supply to the capacitor for charging wouldn't be just 4.5 volts because we do have a voltage divider with 20k and 100k, so it's really 3.75 volts, but we're just approximating. So to get a ballpark here, if I use a 20k resistor here, let's just say for now, to make it simple, this resistor is just going straight to ground. So what kind of current, if I give 4.5 volts here, what kind of current will I get through a 20k resistor? And that would be 225 microamps. Of course, there's going to be some current going through this resistor and some going through the rest of the circuit. As long as I have at least 90 microamps left over going to the base here to turn on this transistor. So I just kind of played around with all the values of parts I had available and what kind of results I wanted. So plugging that into a capacitor charging calculator, we're starting at 0 volts. We're giving it 4.5 volts to work with. 47 micro capacitor, try out a 20k resistor, and I just chose a time of 0.2 seconds. This is for how long it takes to turn on the transistor. I calculate and it tells me what voltage the capacitor is going to have charged up to after 0.2 seconds, and that's about 0.86 volts. So that would be the voltage right here on this base resistor. So if it takes about 0.7 volts on the base to emitter to turn this transistor on, and I've got this capacitor charged up to 0.86, that's enough to turn on the transistor after the 0.2 seconds. And now I just have to figure out what kind of base resistor that I want here to be able to turn on this transistor with at least 90 microamps. So let's double it to around 180 microamps to be sure we have enough current. So we can calculate this resistor now. We have 0.86 volts minus the 0.7 volts that will be on the base divided by 180 microamps target current through it, 900 ohms. Well, I have lots of 1K resistors. The voltage across the resistor divided by a 1K resistor. So that's 162 microamps. And that's more than the 90 microamps needed to turn this on. 
The purpose of this resistor here is to discharge this capacitor when it's time for the LED to turn off. So I'm going to go with one second, ignoring everything else around here. We're just looking at this resistor discharging this capacitor. And keeping in mind, this input here is not being pulled straight to ground when it goes low. Since there's a diode in line here, when the 4017 goes to ground, this diode is reverse biased, so there's going to be some small leakage current here. But essentially, this is going to look like it's floating. Some current will go through the transistor, but we're looking for the impact of a resistor to ground here. So going back to this calculator, we know we had charged up to 0.86 volts. And since the transistor's base needs 0.7 volts to turn on, we're just looking to discharge from 0.86 volts down to the 0.7, and below that the transistor will be turning off. So we want to slow down the turnoff process. And since we are trying to discharge, our supply voltage is considered 0 volts. 47 micro, we're going to say 1 second, and we calculate for the missing resistance needed. That turns out to be around 100k. So ignoring all other discharge current paths, with a 100k to ground here, it'll be about 1 second to discharge from the 0.86 volts down to the 0.7 to keep this transistor on. Then the LED will be turning off as we continue to discharge. And by having this base resistor here, not only are we setting the amount of current here to turn the transistor on, we're also giving us that ability to charge this capacitor up beyond the base fixed 0.7 volts and have the rest dropped across this resistor. And when the capacitor is discharging, it can't just try to dump a whole lot of current into the base here, giving us all kinds of problems. So this just gives us all kinds of control that we can tweak the turn on and turn off time, keep everything behaving. While this capacitor is charging up and the voltage across it is rising, there's something else to consider. For example, when the voltage at the base gets to be 0.7 volts, so the transistor is turned on, and if we say we have a 1K resistor here on the base, targeting a base current of 180 microamps at 0.7 volts, so that will give us an impedance of about 3.88K, from base to ground. So when you consider that in series with a 1K resistor in our example, we really have about 4.88K in parallel with this 100K resistor. So at that point with the transistor turned on, changing the impedance characteristics of this network, 4.5 volts through a diode, going through this new simplified voltage divider, we'll get about 0.85 volts right here at this capacitor. So that's what we would see in our circuit as a steady state charged up value. If it was just a 20k series resistor charging a capacitor, then we would get up to eventually the 4.5 volts. So with all these things in mind, I just kind of chose part values until I got the result I wanted. We're just trying to look at it and explain where it's all coming from. And this may look like a disaster, but I set this circuit up in Tinkercad with a whole lot of ammeters and voltmeters, even a little primitive oscilloscope. So right here there's a switch. Right now it's off, it's on ground, so this diode here, the anode is pulled to ground. Diode is reverse biased. This capacitor here is discharged. It is 47 micro. So if this simulates a 4017 output going high and low at 5 volts, so I'll turn this on, simulating the 4017 going high, up here the LED comes on. I'll do that again. The uh, scope probe here shows we had a rising edge. If I turn this off, the LED dims out, all the current is draining, and the signal is more slowly decaying than it rose. So I turn this back on, the LED comes on, we have 5 volts to start. After this diode, the voltage is 4.5 volts we are actually working with. Then an ammeter says, we would be consuming 182 microamps from the 4017 output altogether. We're going into that 20k, we have a 47 micro to ground, as well as 100k to ground. 
So that's right here, power supply to diode onto a 20K with a capacitor and resistor to ground. We go on to the series 1K resistor and through an ammeter we see 174 microamps of current going into the base of that NPN. So although I could have breadboarded this relatively easily, I'd still have to dig around for parts. And if I want to make all these voltage and current measurements, especially simultaneously, simulating like this can be a good tool. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Stay tuned for more projects and PCB designs. I'll see you on the next video.